Okay, so we're going to bring Allison up now from the Butterfly Corn Group. I'm going to stand over here so I can look at my notes. Um, we had a great discussion, and uh, I want to thank the group for, for all the points that they raised. We had a lot of different stakeholders. Jason didn't have to cut us off and say be more polite, which was good. <laughs> um, and Jennifer Balsiger gave a really good timeline. So our topic was um, about the issues of BT corn and um, monarch butterfly story. And this is a timeline that started back in 1999. So it's a very long timeline. So I think I should get more than 10 minutes, but um, I'll try to <laughs> look at the clock. Uh, OK, there are three waves of publications. And um, the first one was a paper by John Losey that came out in 1999 in the journal Nature, a small lab study um, showing that pollen from BT corn can harm monarch larvae. And um, this is the first example of a media sort of blitz that, that ensued that we heard about yesterday um, that is really very fascinating, how it happened, why it happened, um, could it have been done better? So those were some of the questions that we were looking at. Um, and uh, basically, so there was a New York Times uh, headline, Washington Post headline. The Washington Post headline uh, compared, said BT corn versus the Bambi of insects. Um, so this is a framing of, of, of unexpected effects of genetically engineered crops that is one of the frames that we talked about. Um, the other one being, how do you preserve monarch butterflies and keep them from going extinct? So they're sort of those, those are the two dominant themes of our discussions. But back to the Bambi, um, Bambi resonates with people very well. The monarch butterfly itself, of course, is highly recognizable. So it was kind of a perfect storm of um, the first case that came up that was um, in, a, in a highly regarded journal such as Nature of a, a possible threat of biotechnology type crops, BT corn in this case. Um, so it got a lot of publicity. And it was, there's a lot of uh, themes I wish I could go into. The Cornell University had a press release about this. A little later, they had another press release um, about a publication that Tony Shelton wrote criticizing this study. So Cornell had two different opposing press releases. But meanwhile, um, this just took off. The story took off. A lot of people heard about it. Um, we're not sure if it was responsible for the European Union regulations. They, they, the regulators there were really ready to um, oppose GM crops. And they cited this study as one of the possible risks. Um, so it had a huge impact um, because of the press that it received. Um, okay, and, and the symbol of the monarch butterfly is also still being used by GMO-free labeling, um, and so it's, it has a long, long um, effect that is still resonating with the public. And the monarch butterfly, of course, it also could just mean like a symbol of saving nature. Um, so the fact that the study was about monarchs is just really unique. OK, so that was the first wave. Um, the second wave was uh, six papers that came out in the Proceedings of National Science of the National Academy of Sciences um, in 2001. And all of this is summarized really nicely in a Pew report, um, if you want to get the short version of it. Um, so these papers, uh, as a result of all, all that was revealed in the, in the LOCI study and another field study that confirmed the same thing, um, there was a lot more research done. And bottom line, six more papers came out. The, um, the investigators did not, that their findings were not inconsistent with what Losey found. It's just that these were field studies, and they put everything in perspective. Um, and so, and they're looking at a type of corn where the pollen was not as toxic as the pollen that Losey was looking at. And the type that Losey was looking at was never widely grown. So in a way, his issue was, moot in some respects. But these, these papers came out in 2001. Um, and they came out, they did not get a lot of publicity. They came out right around the time of 9-11. Um, so that was one issue. But we think even if they had come out at another time, it's a lot harder to make news about um, more nuanced studies that show a lack of risk. Um, we didn't see any headlines that said, Bambi is safe. Someone in the group pointed that out. You know, you just don't see that. You only see Bambi's at risk. Um, and so it's still, um, the public still thinks that the pollen from BT corn may be just as toxic as that very first 
or we not the public, the publics. Um, you know, some people may still think that that's an issue. So that was the second wave. The third wave of publications is coming out now, and it's a it's a different question um, about whether Roundup Ready corn maybe um, and other types of herbicide tolerant crops may be so effective that they're wiping out the milkweeds, which are the food source for the monarchs. And so there's some publications coming out showing that. Um, Yes, there's less, less milkweed in the fields, and monarchs are declining uh, in some areas. And, and we didn't go a lot into the science on this because it's, it's a lot newer and less fleshed out. Um, and this is part of a much broader sort of frame of whether agriculture and monarch butterflies can coexist and under what circumstances. But some people see this as a continuation of an, another consequence of genetically engineered crops, and it, it is being publicized in that way. So it's a very interesting, very complex history going back from 1999 to now, having to do with transgenic crops. Um, we were thinking about what could have been done differently or what the different roles of people in the, in the story could have been. So for the scientists um, involved in the very first publication by John Losey, that was a small scale lab study. And there was some disagreement within our group, I think, about whether that should have been published, and if it was published, should they have chosen nature? Um, uh, because it was, it was a small-scale study, and there, there are benefits of public, publishing quickly, and the, the word gets out, but of course there's negatives in that um, the follow-up studies would have been better if, if they were more thorough and had field data. So the scientists have to decide when to publish, how much, whether a, public, a paper might be t and not ready to publish. Um, if you're going to talk to the media, do you want to talk to the media? Or you know, if you're going to talk to the media, have the training. As we heard, we've heard over and over, it's really good to have that kind of training. Um, it's our impression that um, John Losey did not know how big of an effect his <laughs> paper was going to have. He knew it would be important, but not to the extent that it was. Um, so that kind of training would be good. And if you're publishing in a journal like Nature, which um, a lot of advocacy groups are going to be paying attention to, you've got to be ready to really look at the big picture when you're communicating about your research. Um, we also talked about universities and how universities put out press releases, and the Cornell one was kind of strange. Um, one was rushed, and then the next one was contradicted the first one, and that was a while back, but um, people in our group noted that some universities want to promote their investigators' research and hype it. Um, other, pe other universities are more conservative about that. Um, but in any case, um, there is a call to have uh, like at Davis, um, if, if something's going to be controversial, they inform the deans about this. They have sort of a strategic plan when a controversial press release is coming out. And that can work to everyone's advantage to be prepared to be able to talk to the media. Um, in terms of science writers, um, at, there's a lot of points we could cover, but um, trying when you have these very controversial papers to um, really know the context, uh, try to present the context of like what is modern agriculture, what is a BT corn plant, um, to be as fair as possible in getting different points of view um, and awareness of the frames going to the scientists as well as the writers. You all have heard that a million times. Um, but the, in our conclusions, we sort of thought that the media attention to this study was probably inevitable. Um, and the consequences are probably inevitable. It was really the first indication that GM crops could have unanticipated consequences. It was the first kind of red flag. So it was bound to attract a lot of attention. Um, and that we really can't control how these stories are going to unfold even on into the future. Um, but we can be aware of, of the possibilities and just try to prepare as much as possible to get good information out there from all the different people that are providing that information. So I'd like to stop there and see, Jason, do you want to add anything to that or anyone else? That was great. We had a very fun discussion. Yeah, that sounds really meaty. Okay. Questions for Allison or folks in the group? No, no questions? Okay. Okay, thanks, Allison. Sure.